Um, my talk is going to be uh, probably less scientific and uh, less objective and more subjective and a little bit more on the emotional side. Um, this spring or this last uh, winter, we had a workshop in Drayton Valley for some watershed groups that the Land Stewardship Centre put together. And, and one of the last things that we talked about at the end of this workshop was what were your big learnings uh, that came out of this uh, workshop and what were you going to do differently when you left this workshop. And uh, one of the things that I committed to at that workshop was is that I had been through this experience of, of trying something and not succeeding and that I wanted to share with people the lessons that I learned. Just that I didn't succeed, but what did I learn from that experience and, and how could that help other watershed groups that were, were eager and or frustrated or were struggling to try to do the same thing. So um, my presentation today is about the state of the Sturgeon Watershed Group and it's um, kind of the beginnings of it, it's motivation, the stages we went through and uh, then the lessons that I learned in the end. So I'm going to start probably with just uh, just a little bit of a backgrounder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about where is the Sturgeon River watershed. Then I'm going to talk for a few slides about what was the motivation for starting a group like this and how that kind of formed the process or the lessons that we learned going through it. And then I'll give you a little bit of a conclusion which hopefully will be a little bit more upbeat and uh, we'll go from there and hopefully have some questions. So the Sturgeon River watershed, what I want to start with is, is kind of a quote. Um, I've always been inspired by this quote. It's, it's from Margaret Mead who said, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And you know, this really rang true with me and maybe with you guys as well. It's always happened to me that the big things or the big successes in my life have always happened when a small group of us got together and we did something and it was kind of great. So. Um, so remember this quote and the foundation that it provided for me and we'll come back and we'll revisit it when I get to the lessons that I learned. Now uh, I have to point out here that the wonderful, um, uh, the beautiful quote is, is accompanied here by a beautiful photo and the photos in most of my presentation, almost all of them, are from a, a local photographer in St. Albert, his name is Dave Conlin. If you ever have a chance to just Google his name and look at his website, you'll be amazed. He has some beautiful photos. So the Sturgeon River watershed, um, it's located in central Alberta and is one of the 18 sub-watersheds uh, in the North Saskatchewan watershed. Uh, I'm just going to try to point out here a little bit where it is. So it's this uh, darker green uh, watershed here. So the North Saskatchewan, the main stem basically follows them through here, goes through Edmonton and then pops out through Saskatchewan. Uh, the Sturgeon watershed is one of the smaller sub-watersheds and it connects just uh, just across the banks from uh, Fort Saskatchewan. It's what North Saskatchewan considers one of its middle sub-watersheds and uh, these are watersheds that have a lot of agriculture, have urban expansion and uh, these impacts really affect the watershed. So a little bit about the watershed. Um, it is quite small, as I've mentioned. It flows eastward from the headwaters near tiny little Hoople Lake, which is close to Entwistle, and approximately 260 kilometers to confluence with North Saskatchewan River. It covers an area of about 3,300 square kilometers and has very low relief. There's only a difference of 270 meters from the headwaters to where it reaches the North Saskatchewan. It's pretty well a mixture in ecoregions, eco uh, half dry mixed wood and half central parkland. Some of the major lakes that are in, uh, within the watershed are Lac St. Anne, Isle Lake, Big Lake, Sandy, uh, Sandy and Manawan Lakes. An important number that I kind of pulled out and was quite astonished by it was that in terms of the total flows for the North Saskatchewan, it is less than 1% of the total flows for North Saskatchewan. So really it's not a huge contributor to, to flows for, for the area. But nevertheless, it's just, it's just as important. So here's a map of the watershed. I'm just going to point out some of the features again just to give you a bit of context. Um, the headwaters are over here in near Hoopa Lake. It goes through Isle Lake, uh, Lac St. Anne, uh, Onaway, scoots through uh, Big Lake, 
down here through Big Lake, St. Albert, that's where I'm from, and then up, takes a right-hand turn at Gibbons, and then connects with the, with the uh, North Saskatchewan. Um, there's three uh, major counties that it covers, Parkland, Lac St. Anne, and Sturgeon, and a little bit of Westlock. Um, it also um, affects or is includes major areas like St. Albert, Stony Plains, Spruce Grove, Gibbons, Bonacord, uh, and a tiny bit of Edmonton. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of, of what's in uh, the watershed is, it is very, a very developed watershed. 71% of it is agriculture, about half crops, half pasture. There's um, less than 20% of uh, the natural features that are still there, such as treed areas, riparian areas, and wetlands. 5% of it is covered by water bodies, and 4% is developed. Now keep in mind that 4%, because between the major urban areas that are within the watershed, that 4% of developed area has over 3 quarters of the population. And those populations are increasing at a very quick rate. So urbanization is a very big issue facing the Sturgeon River watershed. So just to kind of summarize, the Sturgeon River is really it's a prairie river. It's or a brown water river as it's sometimes called. Our flows are very dependent on rain and snow events uh, within the basin. And our groundwater is linked to uh, groundwater supply. So other rivers that are similar to this are like the Battle or the Vermilion River, to some extent. We're all different, but uh, somewhat similar. So we're a highly developed watershed with strong influences from agriculture and urban, urbanization. So that really kind of summarizes the location we're looking at. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the motivation. So why did we end up wanting to start a group? So, residents were concerned within the watershed for many years about uh, the Sturgeon River, its tributaries, and the lakes within it. Um, things like lake eutrophication, uh, low river levels, uh, fish kills, and wildlife, decreases in wildlife populations. Uh, you might have read in the paper last year that we've had blue-green algae uh, blooms in uh, some of our lakes, like Lake St. Anne or Isle Lake. There was some monitoring done in the 1970s, uh, but very little and kind of sporadic. Most of those programs were, were cut in the 1980s. But in the, in the late 1990s and in early 2000s, there was a resurgence of um, interest in doing something around uh, the health of the Sturgeon River watershed. Some of the other concerns that uh, uh, residents had within the watershed besides the rapid urban development were gravel extraction and as well as stormwater impacts. As these urban areas grow, more and more stormwater is being directed into these water bodies and what were the effects of that on the watershed health. So some of these concerns did lead to some, to some studies and some very good ones. Um, St. Albert at the time uh, in the early 2000s actually was smart enough to decide that they needed an environmental coordinator. And this was around the time that most municipalities kind of thought, you know, this would be a good um, person to have within our uh, administration to help us make or, or adjust to these um, considerations. So lucky for St. Albert that the first uh, coordinator they had was actually Derek Richmond, and he had been a water resources engineer within Alberta environment. So he had a very strong water background. And many of these studies were initiated by him, uh, including a stormwater master plan for the city, uh, a big lake basin stormwater plan, which was just not the city, but uh, a group of seven municipalities. And I'll talk about this one in a little detail later. And then he, he started doing a water quality monitoring program within the city of St. Albert, um, just on our stormwater ponds. Um, in the, in the early 2000s, and this was uh, expanded and continued um, by myself in 2006 when I took over Derek's job, and he retired to beautiful Vancouver Island. So, and if you're interested in more of the water quality side of it or the stormwater effects, I am giving a talk tomorrow about just that. Um, I find it's um, quite interesting, and, and the, the data we have now is for five years, so Data is only as good as uh, you know the number of years that you collect it. So at this point, I think that we have enough to tell a story. Some other important milestones that happened in the uh, in the 2000s were that the state of the North Saskatchewan River Watershed Report was completed. 
And of course, we're a sub-watershed of this. So we started to sit up and say, hey, this is cool. Um, and then also, uh, Big Lake was um, uh, turned into a provincial park, which is the lowest hole centennial provincial park in 2005. So there was really this increase in awareness and motivation and uh, the whole water for life strategy came out. So water was becoming a really big issue. And that contributed to our motivation. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this one uh, report and this one group that, that was really key to the motivation for, for uh, starting a watershed group. Um, the Big Lake Basin's task force was which was basically a collaboration of seven municipalities, um, had real concerns about the effects of the rapid development within the watershed on the flooding capacity and the stormwater effects within the basin. So it was a quite a specific concern, I mean, not like a whole watershed, and it was a specific area and a specific issue. Um, but the important thing to note is that there were seven municipalities that collaborated together. And even more importantly was we uh, collaborated, we got funding and support from the Al Alberta government. We completed this very detailed study, which won uh, numerous engineering awards. And we all agreed to follow the recommendations that came out of that report. Now this may seem very simple to you, but in the municipal world, this is almost unheard of. So not only did we agree on the recommendations that came out of the report, but we all agreed that they would go into our bylaws and our standards. So this would ensure that there was consistency between all the municipalities. Now as much as I'd like to say this was because we had a strong concern for the watershed, uh, this was not the main reason. The main reason is, is that municipalities, particularly these ones, are always under the constant pressure from developers to develop their land base. And if you have one type of bylaw in this municipality and the one across the road has a different one, you're, you're a sitting duck, you're done. So we wanted to have this consistency so that we could all say we were doing the same thing, it was even playing field, and nobody was picking on anybody. Now it has great implications for the watershed, but um, it started from a different place. So this was an uh, enormously successful endeavor. So it created a lot of the motivation and uh, enthusiasm to start this group. So, at the same time, we were also getting increasing concerns from residents. Residents were becoming more aware of water issues and, and the effects on the watershed. We had this big lake task force study. So, in around 2006, we got inspired to start this multi-stakeholder watershed group. So, this is the motivation. So, I've given you the background. I've talked about the motivation. And don't forget, at the beginning I said there's the quote, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. So what happened? What happened after that? The next slides that I'm going to go over are the stages that the group went through and the lessons that we learned. So the city of St. Albert really championed this, um, this effort. Um, we came out of the success of the Big Lake Task Force. Uh, we had support from Alberta Environment and the Land Stewardship Center. And we were very keen to get all of the players together and move forward on a watershed initiative. So we came up with this huge list of, of 200 stakeholders within the watershed, including residents, agriculture, First Nations, Métis, industry, municipalities, other levels of government. And in 2006, we sent out these invitations and we uh, hosted several large meetings uh, in um, St. Albert, plus, plus out in the watershed itself. And we were, we were uh, very excited. We had over 50 attendees at the first meeting. We had lots of emails. We had great phone calls. And we all agreed that there was definitely a need to do this type of thing and that we wanted to get started. So I also want to point out to you at the bottom of this slide is that I have some stars here. And these are going to kind of equate to the stages that I went through. And you can equate it with um, energy level or enthusiasm, whatever you'd like. But I wanted something to visually represent uh, the stages that we go through. So 2006 was great. 2007, um, we decided the big things we had to do were come up with the name of our group, some really foundation objectives, 
and uh, develop our bylaws and get registered as a nonprofit. That was going to be the start. And uh, in these stages, we had help from uh, Bert, both Ernie Waschuk from the Land Stewardship Center and Alberta Community Development. Uh, very helpful, great facilitators. Uh, good job they did. So, our first task: the naming of the group and objectives. I got a bit concerned uh, at this stage when uh, it took us a whole meeting to decide on what the name of the group was going to be. So. As you know, most, most uh, watersheds call themselves an alliance or a council or something like that. We had a, a four-hour debate on the fact that an alliance was too military and quasi-dictatorship, and that council was too governmental and, um, again, this dictatorship sort of thing. So after throwing around numerous possibilities, we finally came up with a very staid and neutral initiative. So Sturgeon River Water Initiative was born. Now developing our bylaws and, and getting ourselves registered as a nonprofit, again, I thought this was going to be quite a simple procedure. I mean, there was lots of examples of bylaws out there, and uh, it was a pretty simple process, let's do it. Um, but by this time, we had probably about 20 or 15 people attending the meetings, and the bylaws were excruciatingly slow. Uh, again, we spent one meeting discussing just one sentence that would properly identify the process and wording for removing a member for not being committed to the objectives of the group. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my energy level at this point is three stars. <laughs> Next year, we get our bylaws approved, we get registered, and um, I feel like we've really jumped this big hurdle and once we get an elected board, we have a process, we're going to move forward, we're going to get a plan, we're going to finish the state of the Sturgeon report, you know, it's going to happen. Um, it didn't happen as quickly as we wanted. We did elect a board, uh, we did sit down to do our strategic plan, uh, we had a great facilitator that came from the Battle River Group to help us, and at this point again we got stalled. Although we agreed on the overall objectives of the group when it came to a path forward, some of the group were ready to develop a state of the Sturgeon report. Let's get some baseline information, get everything together, and move on. Whereas other portions of the group thought we would be better off lobbying the provincial and federal governments to regulate the existing activities within the watershed. They wanted to act now and collect data later. Um, we spent a significant time on coming to uh, somewhat of an agreement on this, but we did decide eventually that we would do collect data first to help us decide on our actions. So once we passed that stage, uh, we wanted to address where we're we going to get the funding to do this report and getting terms of reference together for a consultant. At this point, really the meetings were down to just board members and a lot of times we were barely making our quorum. So 2009, the great news was is that the city of St. Albert, after much lobbying on my behalf in back, back rooms, offered to fund the entire study, as they felt it was crucial to understand the issues facing the entire watershed if we were going to address the issues within St. Albert. We wanted to do something. If this was the way we needed to get the base information, let's just do it. So here, again, I felt like a big hurdle had been uh, achieved. When I presented the good news to the board, the members again were divided. Half of them were very, very happy and positive, and the other felt that if the funding came from one municipality, the study would not be balanced and their concerns would not be addressed. So in the, again, in the end, the group was unable to agree on whether to proceed or not. Most members were frustrated and the lack of progress and did not have the energy to fight another battle. So on December 19th, 2009, we had a special general meeting to dissolve the group. One star. So, three years of effort, innumerable meetings and effort, but it didn't work out. So I want to share with you next what the lessons that I learned from this were, and to share with you uh, some of the ne next steps that we're looking at. So again, how I'm going to do this is, I, I want to come back to our quote. So why didn't it work? I went back to the quote that inspired me in the first place. And as I'm sitting there and I'm crying in my beer, I say, Margaret, what did I do wrong? 
And if Margaret were still alive, I imagined that she would have told me, you didn't read the quote right. So in my mind, I heard Margaret speaking to me. That's after the second or third beer. And she says, it says here, never doubt a small group of thoughtful committed citizens. Did I have a small group? No, I didn't. I started with a huge group, with all the stakeholders. And it, as much as it can be inspiring and enthusiastic and positive experience, it became too overwhelming. And the group was too large and too diverse to make effective progress and to come to consensus even on the most simple issues. So then I said, I understand that, Margaret. What else? And Margaret says, the thoughtful part. She says, did you think, was the group thoughtful? And I said, yes, definitely. The thoughts were all over the place. They were big thoughts and small thoughts, and they were left and right thoughts. And, uh, and she goes, hmm. And they weren't aligned. So we had a whole range of people who were really keen, some were keen to get on the ground and do stuff, some wanted to study, some wanted to focus on agriculture, some wanted to uh, focus on urban areas. So we, we had a thoughtful group, but it was too broad of a range of thoughts to be able to come up with a consensus. And then lastly, I said, okay, Margaret, I get this. So were they committed? And by the end of this process, I was definitely ready to be committed to an institution, but I think what Margaret really meant was somehow, was the group bound or required to do this process? And in the end, I think we weren't. We were basically a group of people who had a similar concern, who uh, wanted to move forward, but we weren't bound by anything. We were volunteers. We were there just giving out of, you know, our heart's content. So, again, I didn't read the print. So okay, maybe I made some bad assumptions, and I said, Margaret, but I will learn from this. So after taking a deep breath and about a year to regroup, here's what happened. I said, okay, if nobody wants to do this state in the watershed report, I'll do it myself. I took my ball and went home because nobody wanted to play. So the city of St. Albert completed the report in 2012 which I think is a very big step. And the baseline information will be used by any watershed group that does move forward with this. Now after another year of pondering and crying my beer, I learned the biggest lesson of all, which was don't be afraid to change the structure of a group if it's not working for you. So what I did was I tried to think of what are situations that worked? What are groups that I really enjoy being with? And what was it within them that was really uh, made a difference. And my mind came back to that Big Lake Task Force that we had in 2004 and 2006. So the lesson I've learned is that I'm going to be moving forward with an all, another small, thoughtful, committed group. But this group is going to be based on an intermunicipal uh, partnership, similar to the Big Lake Task Force. It's going to be small because there's a small group of municipalities, maybe five to ten. We're going to be thoughtful in the same vein because we have similar thoughts. Our purpose is very clear, is that we are supposed to uh, improve our community balancing environmental needs with economics and social factors. Very similar to the, to the factors that the Water for Life follows. And we are definitely committed. Um, we are responsible for land use planning decisions, which are bound into statutory documents like the land use bylaws, engineering standards, etc. So here I am to give it another try. I have some good information. I have the support from uh, some people who have been through it before, uh, North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. I have the enthusiasm of uh, stakeholders and uh, academic institutions like Nate who are here today. And I'm back to four stars. So wish me luck. And I'd like to close by Another quote that I, I find my favorite, and I'm learning that this quote is probably more reliable than uh, Margaret's quote, and it's from Winston. Winston says, success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And by far, that is probably the biggest lesson that I've learned doing this, 
and I will continue to make my efforts not to fail, but to try to bring this watershed group alive and keep you posted on it as years to come.